Hello, hello, and welcome to the Mesh Analysis Sandbox. This is a quick review, followed by some practice problems with solutions. The more you practice these problems, the better you'll get. So please use this video to help yourself get more comfortable with mesh analysis. I highly recommend pausing the video as we go through and trying the examples yourself. Let's go ahead and get started. So here's the goals of this video. First, we will briefly review the procedures for mesh analysis. We'll also cover the special cases of mesh analysis, including super meshes and dependent sources. And finally, we'll get comfortable with mesh analysis by doing examples of increasing difficulty. We'll also look at common questions and mistakes to avoid. Please remember that the best way to improve at solving circuits problems is to practice solving problems yourself. So rather than watching me solve these problems, I highly recommend that you pause this video and try each problem on your own before checking the solution. I hope you find this helpful. Let's go ahead and get started. So first, what is mesh analysis? Mesh analysis is really just a clever way of applying Kirchhoff's voltage law and Ohm's law. In mesh analysis, we use Kirchhoff's voltage law and Ohm's law to write systems of equations in terms of current and resistance. And then, once we have these equations, we can solve for the current in each mesh of a circuit. When mesh analysis is finished, we will know all of the currents flowing in our circuit. So what is a mesh? A mesh is a closed loop path where current flows in a circuit. And we can call these the meshes. And the current of any given mesh is called the mesh current. So the goal of mesh analysis is to try to solve for the unknown mesh currents within a circuit. Let's take a look at the steps. The first step of mesh analysis is to identify all of the meshes. Then we assign a current to each mesh. And often the direction of the current will not necessarily be given. So if the current direction is not already given, then you just pick a direction for the, each mesh current. And then you apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to each mesh to get an equation in terms of currents. And then finally, you solve the resulting system of equations in order to find the solution. So let's go ahead and practice a few of the steps of this mesh analysis process, and then we will cover special cases, and finally we'll do increasingly difficult practice problems with solutions. So I highly recommend that you skip ahead, pause, rewind as needed in order to get comfortable with mesh analysis. First, let's start with the basics. The first step of mesh analysis is to identify the meshes in our circuits. So in this case, let's just briefly identify the mesh in each of the circuits shown. This first circuit has just one path for current to flow, so we can say we have just one mesh and call it something like I1. This second circuit underneath actually has two potential separate meshes here where current can flow. So we, we can use mesh analysis on both of those. And we'll see that this is actually a special case of mesh analysis. We have a shared current source. So in fact, we can also consider a super mesh around the entire perimeter, which avoids that shared current source. We'll return to that a bit later. And then finally, in this third example, you can see we can identify actually three mesh currents in these areas. So if you're to solve any one of these circuits using mesh analysis, the first step would be to identify the meshes as shown here. All right, let's now try the next step of mesh analysis. In the next step, we want to try applying Kirchhoff's voltage law to a mesh. And that allows us to write equations in terms of current. So remember that Kirchhoff's voltage law tells us that the algebraic sum of the voltages 
in any closed path of our circuit, that algebraic sum must be zero. And so before we start writing mesh equations, let's briefly review how to write Kirchhoff's voltage law equations and mesh equations for the three meshes in this circuit. Here's a few things to note about Kirchhoff's voltage law. So first, when we say algebraic sum, that means we must take reference directions into account. What do we mean by reference direction? When we say reference direction, we need to be consistent about which direction is positive and which direction is negative. I like to use what I call the bank account conventions. And so it's kind of like money in your bank account. If you are depositing money, you gain. And if you are spending money, you lose money. So for the bank account convention for voltage, I use the following. For sources, I use a positive sign if I encounter the negative end of the voltage polarity first, and because that's because I'm experiencing a rise, I'm going from a negative to a positive voltage. And for resistors and other passive components, I use a negative sign if I encounter the plus polarity before the minus. And that's because I'm starting at a higher voltage and ending at a lower voltage. I'm experiencing a voltage drop. I'm spending voltage to go across that component. And if my polarity is not given, I assume that the end where the current enters is the positive end of that component. So one other thing to note about the bank account convention is that you might have learned the opposite of this convention, and that's perfectly okay. Either approach will give you a correct Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. The key is to be consistent. So either approach is valid. Please use whichever approach makes sense to you. Most important, just make sure you're consistent in applying Kirchhoff's voltage law, and that way you avoid errors. So here's a quick example of the bank account convention. For example, if I am writing a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation, and I'm walking from the negative end to the positive end of a voltage source, I treat that as a voltage rise. And similarly, if I am walking across a resistor or a component and I'm starting at the positive end or the end current enters and I'm going across that component to the negative end or where current exits, that is treated as a voltage drop or voltage spend. And I give that a negative value in the Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. We do a lot of examples of this convention in lecture five of our circuits class. So I encourage you to also take a look at the examples there if you would like some additional practice. But here, we'll just go ahead and do a quick practice to help everyone see what I mean by writing Kirchhoff's voltage law equations. So here we go. Let's go ahead and write some Kirchhoff's voltage law equations for this circuit with the three meshes shown. Let's start with I1's mesh. The procedure I like to do is I like to start in the bottom left of my circuit, or bottom left of the mesh. And then what I do is I walk in the direction of my mesh current. And then as we walk, we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law as we walk. So let's take a look at I1's mesh. So I'm going to start down here. And I'm going to walk around I1's mesh in the direction of I1, which in this case is in the clockwise direction. So the first thing I walk across is the one volt source. And I'm going from negative to positive. So by bank account of convention, I get plus one volt. Next thing I walk across is a 100 ohm resistor. And 
since I'm walking in the direction of my positive current, I assume that I'm entering the, the higher voltage end, exiting at the lower voltage end. So in that case, I will have some voltage, I'll call it V100 ohm. And I will give that a negative sign because I have to spend voltage in order to go across that resistor from the high voltage to low voltage end. And then similarly, I keep walking around my circuit and you'll see the last component I will walk across in mesh I1 is this 10 ohm resistor. Once again, I assume that since my positive current enters the top end of my resistor, I will experience a 10 volt or a, some voltage drop here across that resistor. And then I know that by Kirchhoff's voltage law, the sum of all these voltages, the algebraic sum, must be zero. So I have one volt coming out of my source, and then I spend that one volt of voltage walking across my two resistors. Real quick, let's go ahead and look at the other two meshes. So let's now take a look at mesh I2, and we'll do the same approach. So we're going to start from the bottom left, and I'm going to walk around my circuit. And let's see what I get. So in this case, notice I2 is, I'll be starting down here. And I'm going to be going around the circuit clockwise, like I drew there. And since I'm walking in the direction of my mesh current, I can assign the polarity of my resistors to be basically in the direction I'm going, because current flows from higher voltage or more positive voltage to negative. And so in this case, let's see what we get. The first thing we walk across is a 200 ohm resistor. So I'm going to experience some voltage drop. I'm going to call it V200 ohms. And since it's a voltage drop, I must write that equation as minus V200 ohms. The next thing I walk across is a two volt source. Notice I'm going from negative to positive. I'm gaining two volts, so I have to give that a positive sign. And then for my other resistors, similar thing happens. I go from positive to negative end, so again, this is minus V300 ohms. Again, I'm experiencing voltage drop because I'm walking in the same direction as my I2. So I'll say minus V100 ohms. And in this case, I'm going to call this one V100 ohms 2. And this one V100 ohms 1. Just because there happens to be two 100 ohm resistors here. And that is our Kirchhoff's voltage law equation for mesh I2. Finally now, let's look at mesh I3. And we'll do the same approach. And if you haven't already done so, consider pausing this video and seeing if you can figure out mesh I3. So in this case, my mesh I3 contains only resistors, so I'm going to assume that there's a voltage drop across each one. So probably one of these resistors will actually ultimately experience a voltage gain, but we'll go ahead and for now, just to be consistent with our convention, we'll go ahead and write Kirchhoff's voltage law equation like this. And re remember, once again, the reason we assumed voltage drop is because we are walking in the direction of mesh current I3, and we assume that positive current is flowing from the higher voltage end to the lower voltage end. So as we go across each resistor, 
we must experience a voltage drop, hence our negative signs. All right, so we just wrote a bunch of Kirchhoff's voltage law equations, but remember our goal for mesh analysis is to write equations in terms of current and solve for the unknown mesh currents. So let's go ahead and take the equations we just wrote for Kirchhoff's voltage law, these three equations, and let's now try writing a mesh equation using the Kirchhoff's voltage law equations that we read. So real quick, let's go ahead and write down the Kirchhoff's voltage law equations again. All right, so let's go ahead and use Ohm's law and our Kirchhoff's voltage law equations to write equations for each mesh. And by rewriting Kirchhoff's voltage law in terms of current and resistance, we'll end up with a mesh equation for each mesh. Let's go ahead and try this for each mesh one by one. So let's first consider mesh one. We need to rewrite our V100 ohm and our V10 ohm terms using Ohm's law. So let's go ahead and consider each resistor. Our 100 ohm resistor actually has two currents flowing through it. We know that coming in to our from, from the bottom side, we have our mesh current I1, and exiting this end of our 100 ohm resistor, we have I2, because we know the mesh current I2 must be flowing all the way around the path with no branches. So then the question becomes, how much current is flowing through the 100 ohm resistor? We know that V100 ohms is equal to I100 ohms times R. So how would we find I100 ohms? It's actually very simple. We can use Kirchhoff's current law. You'll remember Kirchhoff's current law says that the algebraic sum of the currents entering and exiting each node must be zero. In this case, we can write for the node immediately to the left of our 100 ohm resistor, we can write that we have plus I1 minus I2 minus I100 ohms must be zero. Therefore, I100 ohms must equal I1 minus I2. Another way of visualizing this is you could pretend that you're standing in a boat and you want to go across the 100 ohm resistor. You have the current I1 pushing you across the resistor toward the right, and you have current I2 flowing through the upper mesh, kind of opposing your flow. So your net current in I1 direction must be I1 minus I2. So whichever way helps you determine that current, that's what you'll want to use. So in this case, we can replace V100 ohms must be equal to I100 times 100 because we have 100 ohm resistor. And in that case, we just determined that will be equal to I1 minus I2 times 100. We can use a similar approach to find V10 ohms. So if we go ahead and substitute into our Kirchhoff's voltage law, we find that I1's mesh equation is plus 1 minus 100 times I1 minus I2 minus 10 times I3 minus I1 equals 0. So it's very important that you properly calculate the currents going through each of those resistors so that you can get the correct result here. Let's go ahead and take a look at the other two meshes and finish up this example. All right, so for mesh I2, this one actually has some simpler examples as well. Um, let's first consider this V200 ohms and our V300 ohms. In both of these cases, 
the only current flowing through the 200 ohm and 300 ohm resistor, it has to be current I2, because that current I2 is not overlapping with any other mesh. So V200, V200 ohms, that's just going to be 200 I2. V300 ohms, that's just going to be 300 I2. The last ones we need to determine are the voltages across each 100 ohm resistor. And once again, don't be afraid to draw pictures here if it helps you figure out these currents. In the case of our 100 ohm resistor number two, notice what we have. If I draw this picture up close, we have our current I2 entering from above and down below, exiting this node, we have current I3. And we want to find the net current flowing from right to left because we're trying to walk across our 100 ohm resistor from right to left. You'll remember now we're going in the direction of I2. So Kirchhoff's current law tells us that plus I2 minus I3 minus, we'll call it I 100 ohms comma 2 equals 0. So therefore we determine I 100 ohms 2 is just I2 minus I3, and therefore V 100 ohms 2 is equal to 100 times I2 minus I3. And by the same reasoning, you can determine for our last 100 ohm resistor, if we walk still in the direction of I2, we get a similar result. In this case, we determine, if we look at the node If we look at kind of that leftmost node there, we see that we have the current we want to find entering. Then coming up out the top, we have I2. Entering from below, we have I1. So if we apply Kirchhoff's current law, we determine plus I100 ohms minus I2 plus I1 is zero. Therefore, I 100 ohms must be equal to, in this case, it becomes I2 minus I1. And therefore, V 100 ohms 1 is just 100 times I2 minus I1. So if we substitute those terms back in, We determine, again, watch the negative signs here. We have minus 200 I2, that's our V200 ohms, plus 2, minus 300 I2, minus our V100 2, which is minus 100 I2 minus I3. Then we have minus 100 I2 minus I1 equals zero. This is our mesh equation for mesh two. All right, let's finish up with our last mesh, mesh three. And so for mesh three, let's go ahead and find the voltage across each of these resistors. First, let's look at this bottom node for the voltage across our 10 ohm resistor in the direction of I3. I'm sorry, we're solving for the current across the 10 ohm resistor in the direction of I3. We'll call it this I10 ohms. So we know we have this unknown current flowing upward in the direction of I3. That's what we want to solve. Then we know we have I3 entering, I1 leaving. So therefore, we can say for finding V10 ohms, we know V10 ohms is equal to 10 ohms times I10 ohms. And in this case, our I10 ohms can be given by Kirchhoff's current law, 
So we have minus i 10 ohms leaving the node, plus i 3, minus i 1 equals 0. So we go ahead and solve for i 10 ohms. We determine i 10 ohms is equal to i 3 minus i 1. So therefore, we can plug that in. Determine v 10 ohms is 10 times i 3 minus i 1. If you follow a similar procedure, you'll determine that our V100 ohms 2 and our V300 ohms are given by the following. You'll see V100 ohms, we will need to find this current I100 ohms across there, and that current will be given by I3 minus I2. So we'll end up with 100 ohms times I3 minus I2. And then finally, the current across this 300 ohm resistor will just be I3. Because that is the only current flowing through this particular branch of the circuit. So therefore, we substitute in. And we determine that our mesh equation for mesh 3, that mesh equation is given by minus 10 times I3 minus I1 minus 100 times I3 minus I2 minus 300 I3 equals 0. And if you happen to use the opposite sign convention as I did for voltage rises and drops, you end up with the same exact equation without the minus signs, but again, mathematically, it's the exact same result. If you'd like more practice on these, once again, I encourage you to check out our lecture five. But it turns out Writing these mesh equations is actually the trickiest part of mesh analysis. And once you have successfully written all your mesh equations, all that's left is to solve those equations to determine the unknown currents. All right, before we dive into our examples, let's just answer a couple common questions. First, what if the current arrows aren't given? As we mentioned previously, if the current arrows aren't given, you have to assume a direction. And you don't need to worry about trying to guess the direction the current is actually flowing. Nobody can guess that perfectly, especially in complex circuits. So you can assume any direction for your mesh currents as long as you stay consistent throughout the circuit and as long as you correctly apply Kirchhoff's laws and Ohm's laws later on. For example, in the circuits shown here, either this top circuit or the bottom circuit will result in a correct solution for mesh analysis. But in the case of the circuit number two, the mesh currents in the counterclockwise direction, you'd actually solve that they would be negative because we have a positive current source flowing current in. So worst case, if you calculate that a current value is negative for your mesh, that just means that the actual current is flowing in the opposite direction as the one that you assumed. So mathematically, even if you assume the wrong direction when assuming mesh currents, you will still end up with the correct value. You just might need to flip the sign if you get a negative result. One other common question, sometimes people ask, well, what do I do if the polarities aren't given across my resistors? And remember that we assume positive current is flowing from a high voltage to a lower voltage. You know, you might remember if you've watched our lectures about passive convention, current flows from high voltage or the more positive voltage to the low voltage or the more negative part of the component. And so when we think about polarity, the thing to remember is if we assume our positive current or our mesh current is entering the top of these resistors, R1 and R2, we must assume the polarities are shown with positive on top. So again, if you're assuming a positive mesh current, 
entering one end of a resistor, that end where the current is entering must be the positive polarity. And of course, if you accidentally calculated that your mesh currents are actually negative and going in the opposite direction, then you would need to reverse the polarity and reverse the current direction. All right, before we dive into our examples, let's just briefly cover two other special cases of mesh analysis. The first special case is when we have a current source shared between two meshes, and second is when we have dependent sources. So first, if we have a mesh analysis problem we're trying to solve, and we have a shared current source, that means a current source that is overlapping between meshes. So here we see both mesh I1 and I3 have this shared current source here. So if we have a situation like this, what we do is we create something called a super mesh. And rather than trying to apply mesh analysis and Kirchhoff's voltage law around mesh I1 and I3, we instead apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around the super mesh. And this allows us to avoid that shared current source and get a Kirchhoff's voltage law equation without having to have that shared current source in there. And you can see we can apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to get some sum of voltages and then rewrite and get equations for our mesh currents. The other special case of mesh analysis is when we have dependent sources. And the approach is very similar to what you would do for node analysis with dependent sources. What you want to do is you want to rewrite the controlling current or voltage of that dependent source as a function of the mesh currents. Once you've done that, you just proceed as normal. All right, so let's go ahead and begin our mesh analysis sandbox. So the rest of this video is all about practice. We have a bunch of example mesh analysis problems with solutions. The first problems are easier, very simple examples, and towards the end, the problems are very similar to questions I've put on past exams. So the idea here is to get more comfortable with problems of increasing difficulty. So I highly recommend here that you pause the video and try each example first on your own before going through and checking your work against my solution. And just a friendly reminder, mesh analysis really, it can be kind of scary and intimidating at first, but the more you practice, the easier it gets. This really is one of the most important tools we learn in circuits class, and we're gonna use it all semester long. And so please do invest the time you need to learn mesh analysis well. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out. So let's go ahead and start our mesh analysis sandbox. Let's go ahead and start with example one. And so in this example, we're asked to use mesh analysis to find current I1 in the circuit shown. And your first thought might be, wait a minute, Professor Erickson, this example looks really simple. This looks like something I could solve by just combining resistors and using Ohm's law. And yes, that's definitely true. But in this case, let's go ahead and try solving for the current I1 using the mesh analysis technique that we learned. So I encourage you to pause the video and try this example yourself and then take a look at my solution. So let's go ahead and give this example a try. Now remember that the first step of mesh analysis is to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. So in this case, let's go ahead and start in the bottom left corner of the circuit. And let's walk around the circuit 
in the same direction as I1, in this case in the counter in the clockwise direction. And let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law as we go. And so if we do this, we will determine that we have plus 10 volts, because we gain 10 volts going across that voltage source. And then we have voltage drops across the 3 ohm and 6 ohm resistor. So we'll have plus 10 minus V3 ohms minus V6 ohms equals zero. Okay, so that gives us Kirchhoff's voltage law. Our next step is to write our mesh equation by rewriting the voltages in terms of the mesh currents. And in this case, we just have our mesh current I1. So by Ohm's law, we can say that this V3 ohms and V6 ohms, they would just be given by 3I1 and 6I1. And therefore, if we substitute back into Kirchhoff's voltage law, we get our mesh equation. So therefore, our mesh equation becomes plus 10 minus 3I1 minus 6I1 equals zero. And last thing we need to do is solve this equation for I1. And so we end up getting negative 9I1 must equal negative 10. And so therefore, I1 must equal 10 ninths amperes. Notice this is the same result as if we would have combined resistors. Had we combined the 3 ohm and 6 ohm resistor into a 9 ohm resistor, we would have determined by Ohm's law, the same result. We would have determined I must be equal, equal to 10 volts divided by 9 ohms. So you get the same result. But notice that in this case, we were able to get the same result using mesh analysis. Okay, let's go ahead and continue with our next example, which is example two. In this example, we are asked to write the mesh equations for the mesh currents I1 and I2. So we are already given I1 and I2. We just want to write the mesh equations for each of these currents. So let's go ahead and give this one a try. And if you'd like, pause the video and try it yourself first. So let's go ahead and find these mesh equations, starting with I1. For I1, let's go ahead and start in the bottom left corner of our circuit, and let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. If we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law, we're going to walk across the 12 volt source. We're gonna have some voltage drop across this first 100 ohm resistor. I'll call it V100 ohm one. And then we will have another voltage drop. I'll call it V100 ohm two across that second 100 ohm resistor. And so therefore, if we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law, we get plus 12 volts minus V100 ohms one minus V100 ohms two equals zero. And then notice here that we need to rewrite V100 ohm one and V100 ohm two in terms of the mesh current. So in this case, you'll notice for V100 ohm one, we know that V100 ohm one must be equal to 100 ohms times I1 since only current I1 flows through. However, for V100 ohm two, 
we know that that voltage must be equal to the 100 ohm resistor times whatever current is going through this vertical resistor. And we so let's find this I100 ohm too. So one way to do this is to look at this top node here. I'm going to go ahead and redraw that top node right here. So we know I100 ohm 2 is the current flowing downward through the 100 ohm resistor. And we know we have current I1 entering this top node. And we know we must have current I2 also entering, because the way we've drawn the currents, we have I1 going in the clockwise direction and I2 going in the counterclockwise direction. So if we apply Kirchhoff's current law, we determine that we have plus I1 plus I2 minus I100 2 must be zero. Therefore, I100 2 must be equal to I1 plus I2. So if we go back to our V100 ohms, we can substitute that in. Determine V100 ohms 2 must be 100 times I1 plus I2. Now that we have these two terms, we can substitute back to get our mesh equation for I1. And we have, we have the plus 12 volts minus 100 I1 minus 100 I1 plus I2 equals zero. So that is our mesh equation for I1. How would we find the mesh equation for I2? Well, let's take a look. So notice what I2 actually is. It turns out that we actually know I2. I2 is the current flowing through the right-hand mesh of our circuit, and we see that we have this 25 milliamp source. So in this particular case, the mesh current I2 must be 25 milliamps. And remember, the current going through this shared 100 ohm resistor, that will be I1 plus I2 because we have that mesh overlapping, that resistors overlapping. So both currents I1 and I2 flow through this 100 ohm resistor. But over on the right hand side here of our circuit, only current I2 will be flowing. And because we have that 25 milliamp source, we can say I2 must be 25 milliamps. Therefore, our mesh equations for the entire circuit are 12 minus 100 I1 minus 100 I1 plus I2, and I2 is 25 milliamps, or 0 0.025 amps. So you can actually take those two equations, with two equations to unknowns, you can solve for I1 and I2. go ahead and try example three. The first thing I'd like to say about example three is please don't be scared by this bridge circuit. You'll see that these are actually pretty straightforward to solve. In this example, ask to use mesh analysis to find the currents I1 and I2. And if it helps, you can notice that the bridge circuit can also be drawn like this. Notice we have a five volt source and there's one path above. So we have our five volt source with a 10 ohm and 47 ohm resistor. 
And there's a second possible path through the five volt source and a 68 ohm and 150 ohm resistor. So here, to do mesh analysis, we just need to consider these two meshes. And in this case, we know that mesh I1 is the current flowing through this red portion with the 10 ohm, 47 ohm resistor and five volt source. And our second mesh current I2 is the current that goes through the 68 ohm and 150 ohm resistors. All right, so let's go ahead and write these mesh equations and solve this circuit. Remember the first step for writing our mesh equations is to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. And in this case, we were given that our mesh I1 has current flowing assumed to be in the clockwise direction. So if we walk around mesh I1 in the clockwise direction, we will first restart in the bottom left and walk around. We will determine we have voltage drop across the 10 ohm resistor. Then we have a voltage drop across the 47 ohm resistor. And notice we're assuming that current is entering in the same direction as I1 has been drawn. So we treat voltage across 10 ohm resistor and then the downward voltage across 47 ohm resistor that is treated both as drops. And then we have plus five volts equals zero. And notice in this case that our next step is to rewrite this equation in terms of our mesh currents. But looking at our circuit, we say that only I1 is flowing through the 10 ohm and 47 ohm resistors. So therefore, our mesh equation becomes, we have V10 ohm must be equal to 10 I1, and V47 ohms must be equal to 47 I1. And our mesh equation, mesh equation for I1 therefore becomes minus 10 I1 minus 47 I1 plus five volts must equal zero. And now we can repeat the same process for the lower mesh. And then once again, if we, in this case, let's go ahead and start in the upper left and walk in the direction of I2. We assume that we have a voltage drop across the 68 ohm resistor. And since we're going in the direction of I2, we also assume we have a voltage drop across the 150 ohm resistor walking upward. And so if we go ahead and write that equation, we'll determine that we have minus V68 ohms minus V150 ohms plus five volts must equal zero. And you'll notice once again that only I2 is flowing through the 68 ohm and 150 ohm resistors. So V68 ohms in this case is 68 I2. V150 ohms is 150 I2. 
the mesh equation for I2 becomes negative 68 I2 minus 150 I2 plus 5 equals 0. And now if we solve for I2, we get negative 218 I2 is negative 5, and therefore I2 is equal to 5 over 218 amperes, which is approximately 0 0.0229 amperes. So by doing mesh analysis, we were able to find both of those currents. All right, let's continue on with example four. And this example is actually a good example of a special case for mesh analysis. In this example, we are told to use mesh analysis to find the current I sub A. But notice this. What is this? This is a shared current source. So that means we need to use a super mesh to help us solve this particular circuit. So let's go ahead and use what we learned about super meshes to solve this. And you'll notice we also have a dependent source. And remember, dependent sources, we need to relate them to the mesh current. And it turns out that this dependent source already depends on our mesh current I sub A. So in this case, we can just go ahead and proceed with Kirchhoff's voltage law as normal. So I encourage you to pause the video and try this one yourself, and then take a look at how we do it. So our first step is to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. And in this case, we need to use a super mesh around the outer perimeter. So if we go ahead and pretend we're walking around this super mesh, notice that the super mesh allows us to avoid the two amp source. So that's why we want to do the super mesh. But the two amp source is not gone. It's just we're, we're not needing to apply Kirchhoff's voltage law directly across it. We still need to consider that two amp source later when considering current through the three ohm resistor. Okay, so let's apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around our super mesh. And if we do that, we're going to have some voltage drop across the 6 ohm resistor. We'll have some voltage drop across the 3 ohm resistor. And then we also need to consider that 3 I sub A. So we'll have some voltage drop there. So if we apply Kirchhoff's voltage law, we will determine that we have minus V 6 ohms, minus V 3 ohms. And then we walk across this dependent source. We're going from the positive end to the negative end. So we treat that as a voltage drop. So we're going to lose minus 3 I sub A volts. And everybody must sum to zero. If we look at the voltage across our 6 ohm resistor, we see that the voltage across the 6 ohm resistor must be equal to 6 I sub A volts, because only I sub A is flowing through that resistor. However, the same cannot be said for the 3 ohm resistor. Let's consider Kirchhoff's current law above the 2 amp source. So we know above the 2 amp source we have that current I3 ohms coming through the 3 ohm resistor above. We have I sub A entering through the 6 ohm resistor, and we have 2 amps entering from the independent source. So if we apply Kirchhoff's current law at this node, we have plus I sub A, plus 2 amperes, minus our I3 ohms, equals 0. Now 
So therefore, the current through our 3 ohm resistor must be equal to I sub A plus 2. Really important to make sure you calculate that current correctly in order to get the right result here. So therefore, based on this analysis, we can conclude that V3 ohms must be equal to 3 times I sub A plus 2, because that is 3 times the current I3 ohms. All right, so with that information, we can go ahead and substitute back in to our Kirchhoff's voltage law equation and solve for I sub A. We have minus 6 I sub A, minus 3 times I sub A plus 2, minus 3 I sub A equals 0. If we combine terms, that gives us minus 12 I sub A, minus 6 equals 0. And therefore, we determine I sub A is actually equal to minus 0 0.5 amperes. Because we calculated a negative sign, that means I sub A is actually flowing in the opposite direction that we assumed. There you have it. Not too bad, right? The super mesh actually made things a little bit easier in this case. Let's now try example five. This example is actually taken from an old exam question that I gave a while back. In this example, we are asked to determine I sub X, R1, and the amount of power supplied by this dependent current source. Let's look at each part one by one. First, let's find I sub X. And you'll notice that we have kind of several things going on here. Let's consider this top node. If we look at our top node, we have nine I sub X amperes entering from the bottom. We have I sub X amperes entering from the right. And we have two milliamps exiting from right to left. So if we apply Kirchhoff's current law to this top node, we will determine that we have plus IX plus nine IX minus two milliamps equals zero. And in this case, we can determine that 10 IX must be equal to two milliamps. Therefore, Ix has to be 0 0.2 milliamps, or 0 0.0002 amperes. Okay, now that we have found the first part, current Ix, let's continue with the rest of the question. So in our next part of the question, we want to find the value of resistor R1. And what you should notice here is that we have a shared current source. So this is the special case of mesh analysis where we need to write a super mesh equation. And you'll remember, we define our super mesh to be Kirchhoff's voltage law around an area which does not include that shared current source. So in this case, I'm going to define my super mesh as the outer perimeter of my circuit. And so I will go ahead and apply Kirchhoff's voltage law while walking around my circuit. Let's go ahead and start in the bottom left, and I'm going to go ahead and walk clockwise around my circuit from the bottom left. And so in that case, I'm going to define some voltages, since I'm assuming that I'm walking in the 
clockwise direction, I'm going to assume my voltages are also measured in those directions. And so therefore I have voltage drops, I'm assuming across R1, the 100 ohm and 200 ohm resistor, as well as a 20 volt voltage drop when I walk downward across that voltage source. Therefore, my Kirchhoff's voltage law will give us minus VR1, minus V100 ohms, minus V200 ohms, minus 20 equals zero. Now let's find the voltage across each of these values in terms of our current. So for VR1, notice that I'm walking across R1 from bottom to top. I know I have two milliamps of current flowing in the opposite direction. So you wanna be careful here to avoid sign errors because that means the current I have in the upward direction must be negative two milliamps. I need to flip my sign and make sure I calculate voltage in the correct direction. So in this case, because I am walking from the bottom to top of the resistor, I am assuming a current of negative two milliamps in that direction, and therefore I determine that the voltage across resistor R1 is basically R1 times negative 0 0.0002 amperes. And then similarly, we want to be careful of that with our voltage across the 100 ohm resistor also because I am walking in the opposite direction of that 2 milliamp current. So I have negative 2 milliamps of current going in the direction I'm walking. And then finally, the voltage across our 200 ohm resistor, remember we're going in the opposite direction of I sub X. So that means that will be negative one times I sub X times 200 ohms. And in this case, that will give us negative one times 0 0.0002 amperes for I sub X times 200. And then finally, of course, our 20 volts is already known. So all that's left is to substitute these values back in to our Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. And so we end up with one equation and the one unknown is our resistance R. So if we go ahead and solve for that, we end up with negative minus 0.002 R1 minus negative 0 0.2 minus negative 0 0.04 minus 20 equals zero. Solving for R1, we end up with R1 is equal to 9880. The last part of the question asks to find the power supplied by the dependent current source. We know that the power must be equal to current times voltage. We know the current already. That current is basically 9IX, which is equal to 9 times 0 0.0002 amperes. You have to be a little careful when solving for V, however. Notice the voltage is not equal to 20 volts because the 9IX dependent source is not in parallel with the 20 volt source. Notice there's also this 200 ohm resistor here. So some of the 20 volt source is going to be dissipated by that 200 ohm resistor. So we cannot say there's 20 volts across that 9IX source. However, we do know that the 9AX source is in parallel with the 100 ohm plus R1 resistors. So if we find the voltage spent across both of these two resistors, 100 ohm and R1, we can then determine the value for V. So we can say that the value V must be equal to, if we combine these resistors, 
it would be equal to the 2 milliamps of current times 100 ohms plus R1. Since the 9IX source is in parallel with these resistors. And so if we go ahead and solve that, we'll determine that our voltage V must be equal to 20.24 volts. So again, we can plug in 9880 here. And then substituting back, we determine that power is current times voltage. Substitute V and our current I, and we determine that that's about 0 0.036 watts. And there you have it. This question is actually pretty similar to one I used to give on some old exams, so it's a good practice of supermesh as well as Kirchhoff's current law and series versus parallel. All right, this next example asks us to find the voltage across the 8 ohm resistor. And if you've watched our node analysis sandbox video, you might have noticed that this is actually the same circuit that is given in one of the examples in node analysis as well. So it certainly is possible to solve example 6 using node analysis, but in this case, let's go ahead and see how we can solve example 6 using a different approach with mesh analysis. So in this case, the thing you want to do is recognize that we can actually apply Kirchhoff's voltage law around the mesh containing I sub A. And notice that 6, six amp source, that basically tells us that the current on the left-hand mesh must be 6 amperes and then we have some other current I sub A going through the right-hand mesh. So therefore, if we can find I sub A using mesh analysis, then we can determine V 8 ohms. So we know that V 8 ohms must be equal to 8 ohms times I sub A. So let's go ahead and give this a try. Let's go ahead and first apply Kirchhoff's voltage law to the right-hand mesh. So I'm going to start in the bottom left. And I'm going to walk clockwise around. So if I do that, I will have first, I'll walk across this resistor, I'll have minus V4 ohms, because I'm walking in the same direction as my assumed mesh current. I treat that as a voltage drop. Then I walk across 3 I sub A. I'm going from the negative to the positive end, so I'm going from lower voltage side to higher voltage side. That means I must be gaining 3 I sub A volts. And then notice I'm walking downward across that 8 ohm resistor, so that means I'm going to lose 8 I sub A volts. But in this case, for now, let's go ahead and just write it as V8 ohms. And that's equal to 0. Now we need to rewrite the V4 ohms and V8 ohms in terms of our mesh currents. So we know that V8 ohms, that has to be equal to 8 ohms times I sub A, because we are given that I sub A is the current going through the 8 ohm resistor. But for the 4 ohm resistor, we have to be a little more careful. Once again, let's kind of draw this node, and you'll see that we have 6 amperes must be flowing outward from, from left to right on the bottom node. So we know we have 6 amperes going out 
the bottom of the note. And then up through our 4 ohm resistor, we need to find that current. And then coming into our node on the bottom, we have I sub A coming in. So if we apply Kirchhoff's current law at the bottom node, we will end up with plus I A minus I 4 ohms minus 6 amperes equals zero. Solve for I 4 ohms. We'll determine the current through our 4 ohm resistor must be equal to I sub A minus 6 amperes. So therefore, V4 ohms is 4 ohms times I sub A minus 6. Now that we have both of those terms, we can substitute back in to our Kirchhoff's voltage law equation. And notice we'll end up with one equation and one unknown. So we have our minus 4 times I sub A minus 6 plus 3 I sub A minus 8 I sub A equals 0. And we go ahead and solve for I sub A. In this case, we get minus 4 I sub A plus 24 plus 3 I sub A minus 8 I sub A is 0. So we get 24 must equal 9 I sub A. So I sub A is 24 ninths. And of course, we're trying to find V8 ohms. V8 ohms was equal to 8 I sub A. So that will be 21.33 volts. So not so bad, right? If you recognize how to use Kirchhoff's voltage law and super meshes and mesh analysis, this question's actually not too bad. Let's go ahead and finish with our last example. So in this example, we're asked to find the voltage across the 6 ohm resistor. And you might think that, hey, wait a minute, this question could be solved using node analysis. And yes, it could be. And if you take a look at our node analysis sandbox, you'll see that indeed we can solve this question using node analysis. But for the purpose of this video, let's go ahead and solve for this voltage value by using mesh analysis. If you haven't already, I encourage you to pause this video and give this example a try yourself. This is actually really similar to a previous exam question I've given. Let's go ahead and talk through it. So once again, you don't want to be intimidated by this dependent source because it actually gives us a big hint. This is a shared current source. So let's go ahead and use a super mesh. So let's go ahead and assume we have a super mesh as I've drawn. And let's start in the bottom left and apply Kirchhoff's voltage law. And we'll go ahead and walk clockwise around. If we do that, we will have plus 12 volts minus the voltage across our 8 ohm resistor minus the voltage across our 6 ohm resistor, minus the voltage across our 4 ohm resistor, and all of that must sum to zero. And now we need to rewrite the voltages in terms of our mesh current. And so we see that V8 ohms, that one has to be equal to 8IX because we're given that we have I sub X going through there. And notice by Kirchhoff's current law, 
I sub X must also be flowing through the 4 ohm resistor because the 4 ohm resistor and 8 ohm resistor, 12 volt source, these are all in series. And we know that through this particular part of the circuit, there's only one path. So I X has to be flowing through this entire path. So therefore, V4 ohms is also equal to 4 I X. So that's a very important distinction to make here. It's always a good idea to review series versus parallel and recognize that these three components, the 4 ohm, 12 volt, and 8 ohm resistors, they're all in series here. So we can make that conclusion. But then how about the 6 ohm resistor? Notice that the current entering the 6 ohm resistor is not going to be IX. Let's apply Kirchhoff's current law to the top node. We apply Kirchhoff's current law at the top node. Look what we get. We know we have IX entering from from left to right. We have two IX entering from below, and we have our unknown I6 ohms exiting. So by Kirchhoff's current law, we can say plus IX plus two IX minus I6 ohms equals zero, or I6 ohms must be equal to three I sub X. Therefore, we can conclude voltage across our six ohm resistor must be the six ohm resistance times the three IX current. So V6 ohms must be 6 ohms times 3IX, 18IX. So let's go ahead and substitute back in. And we determine that we have plus 12 minus 8IX minus 6IX. Oops, I'm sorry. 8IX minus 18IX minus 4IX equals 0. And that gives us minus 30 IX equals negative 12. IX is 0 0.4 amperes. But we're not trying to find IX. We're trying to find V6 ohms. V6 ohms is 18 IX, or 18 times 0 0.4, which gives us 7.2 volts. And there you have it. So this is a really nice question because it can be solved by either node analysis or mesh analysis. But the key is to remember that these 8 ohm and 4 ohm resistors are actually in series with each other. And that makes it a lot easier to solve the question. All right, so that concludes our mesh analysis sandbox. I hope you found this helpful. And I hope you found that these examples were really great practice to help you get more comfortable with mesh analysis. And if you'd like additional practice and additional review, please do consider checking out our lecture five from our intro to circuits and devices. And you'll see that we have some additional practice and more detailed explanation in that lecture. So thanks everyone. And we'll see you in the next video.